This is a lecture about the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran has a population of 88.3 million people. The main ethnic groups in Iran consist of the Persians, which are the majority, the Azeris, the Kurds, Lurs, Baluchis, a small minority of Arabs, Turkmen, and Turkic tribes. The majority religion in Iran's demographics is Muslim, which are followers of the faith of Islam. There are two main sects in Islam, Sunni and Shiite. Iran is a Shiite country, so the vast majority of Iranian Muslims are Shiite. Between 90 and 95 percent are Shiite. You have minority religious groups that are Christian, Baha'i, agnostic, and others, including Zoroastrianism, Jew Judaism or Jewish identity, Hindu, and others. It's important to understand the Sunni-Shia sectarian dynamics in the Middle East region to understand Iran's geopolitics, national security, and strategic interests. Mainly, we see a, an Iranian-Saudi rivalry in the region. I will talk about how that originated it mainly begins with the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran. And it also has to do with geopolitical competition between the two countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia, as well as their sectarian ideological competition. As I mentioned, Iran is majority Shia or Shiite the word Shiite has variations in spelling, but it means the same thing, Shiite or Shia. It's a global minority in terms of demographics. Sunni Islam, or the Sunni sect, is a global majority. Think of them in terms of, in Christianity, Protestants and Catholics. That's the kind of analogy you can make regarding the sectarian differences. Iran has a very rich history, and the Persian civilization dates back to very ancient times. Iran has a history of Persian empires and dynasties, some of them very notable, like Cyrus the Great as one of the great Persian leaders, the Ghaznavid Empire. They have been invaded by the Mongols as well, as you can see in the 13th century. The Safavid Empire. And then the last uh, uh, dynasty and empire for the Persian civilization is the Qajar Empire or Qajar Dynasty, 1794 to 1925 AD. It's important to note that the transition in the early 20th century from the Qajar Empire goes into the modern era of the Shah of Iran's dynasty. Shah in Persian language means king. In the 20th century, around 1920, uh, 1925, you see the Qajar dynasty transition to the Pahlavi dynasty. Pahlavi is the name of the Shah of Iran's dynasty. You have two Shahs in the modern era, two kings. Shah means king. You have Shah Reza Pahlavi, who transitioned from the Qajar dynasty to Shah Reza's king rulership in 1925 to 1941, he abdicates his throne in 1941, and his son, Muhammad Reza Shah, 
takes over and succeeds his father from 1941 all the way until the revolution in 1979. However, in that process and time frame, you also see a very important piece of history in the Cold War era when the United States CIA, together with the Secret Intelligence Service of Britain, launch a coup to overthrow a democratically elected uh, leader in Iran who ousted the Shah of Iran, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, in 1953, Mohammad Mossadegh comes to power democratically. The Shah of Iran sees this as an ouster, which actually is not the case. It was a democratic process where Mohammad Mossadegh comes to power. Remember that this is the Cold War, so Cold War politics are primary in the minds of Western political leaders, particularly the Eisenhower administration. The British are also concerned that the Shah of Iran, uh, being uh, no longer in power, is going to be um, no longer friendly to uh, uh, British interests, particularly the Anglo-Iranian oil industry and company. The British have long had a stake in the Iranian oil industry. Iran is a very oil-rich country. For the United States, in the Cold War perspective, when Mossadegh tries to nationalize Iranian oil, the, the term nationalize is a buzzword or a danger word for the United States in terms of Cold War politics. It translates into the possibility or potentiality of that country's uh, politics leaning towards uh, not the West, but the Soviet Union. That was not the case, but there is a, a, a view or a perspective in the Eisenhower administration that there's a danger that Mossadegh will lead Iran into that direction. The pretext to this is that the Shah of Iran, the King of Iran, up to that point, was very pro-West, very pro-American. So the CIA and the British, SIS, launched a coup that overthrew Mossadegh from power and replaced him by reinstalling the Shah of Iran, the King of Iran, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah, back into power, back on the throne, and maintaining the monarchy in Iran. Now, Iran is, a, is at that time an absolute monarchy, so uh, Shah, the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Shah, is at the time an absolute monarch. What's important to note about this is that by reinstalling the Shah of Iran, the United States and Britain inadvertently derailed democracy or democratization for Iran in the future because Mohammad Mossadegh was brought to power democratically. Now again, this, it's important to understand the Cold War politics context of those decisions. Mohammad Mossadegh ends up being imprisoned and he dies in prison. There's also the use of the Savak, the secret police of the absolute monarch, Shah of Iran. And the Savak, the secret police, is trained by the United States CIA and the Israeli Mossad. The Shah of Iran being an absolute ruler and uh, having the tool of the Savak allows him to crack down on any dissent or challenges to the throne. So in the minds of the public in Iran, the Savak and the absolute monarch are seen as oppressors of the people of Iran. Also in the minds of the people from 1953 to 1979, 
the brutality and oppression of the monarch and the Sadak, the secret police, are seen as tools of the West, particularly because the United States and Britain reinstalled the Shah in, in, in power in Iran in the 1953 coup, and also the CIA and Israeli Mossad trained the Savak secret police. Then you see from 1953 after the coup, uh, when the Shah is reinstalled, all the way to the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, that 1979 is a very pivotal year for the Middle East and even global politics. Why is 1979 such a pivotal year? Well, let's take a look. So the revolution in Iran, which has been noted to be an authentic bottom-up revol social revolution, much like the French Revolution, it starts to brew in 1978 and reaches its peak and comes to fruition in early 1979. Once the Shah of Iran, this is Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, flees Iran in early 1979, you see uh, Ayatollah Khomeini return from exile into Iran and it's noteworthy that he, this is Ayatollah Khomeini, was constantly a thorn in the side of the monarchy in Iran, the Shah of Iran, because he provoked anti-monarchy, anti-Shah sentiments within Iran. Because of that, he was thrown out of Iran. He went into exile. Uh, at the end of his exile, he was in Paris. When the revolution happens, the Shah of Iran is outside of the country, mainly to seek cancer treatment. And the revolutionaries use that as an opportunity to bring the revolution to full fruition. And that's when, in February 1979, you see Ayatollah Khomeini actually return to Iran from exile. Also, you see in this year, 1979, the forging of the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, which is called the Camp David Accords, the very first Camp David Accords of 1979, and the Carter administration was very much involved in that. This is when you see the very first time that an Arab country, Egypt in particular, makes peace with Israel. You also see once Ayatollah Khomeini takes power in Iran, he sets up a brand new political system which is based on an, a Shiite or Shiite theocracy. So it's no longer a monarchy, but a theocracy. And he changes the name of the Republic of Iran to the Islamic Republic of Iran. In Pakistan in 1979, you see a military general come to power. His name is General Zia ul Haq, and he comes to power through a coup d'etat in Pakistan. That's important because of what happens in December, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You also see in July of 1979, uh, the uh, rise to power of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. That has implications for, for what happens with post-revolution Iran, and you'll see that in coming slides. In November, Ayatollah Khomeini's revolutionaries are at their fever pitch, and they decide to seize the US embassy in the capital Tehran in Iran. And then also, parallel to that, you see, <coughs> you see the seizure of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, Mecca being the birthplace of Islam. 
That's important because in the minds of the Saudi uh, security services and royal family, they made the presumption at the time that the seizure of the Grand Mosque by a group of militants was the work of post-revolutionary Iran, but that is not the case. It turns out to be a Sunni extremist within Saudi Arabia and his followers. The reason why that's important is because this is when you see the uh, Saudi-Iran relationship become very um, uh, tense because prior to that, the Saudis and the Shah of Iran, the monarchy of Iran, were on good terms. But once the revolution happens and Ayatollah Khomeini comes to power in Iran, and he starts, Khomeini starts to uh, talk about exporting the Shiite revolution and ideology. This creates a lot of tension and animosity in the Sunni Arab countries in the Middle East, especially the Arab Gulf oil-rich countries in the Persian Gulf regions, which happen to be all monarchies. Saudi Arabia is in the forefront of that and becomes very, uh, very tense and very uh, 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 security-wise becomes very aware and alert about what Khomeini is doing in, in, in his speeches uh, in, trying to, in trying to provoke a similar revolution in, in the neighborhood. You also see the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December of 1979. And this leads to uh, the United States, now under the Reagan administration, with a very anti-Soviet Cold War policy of containment of the Reagan doctrine, reach out, reaches out to Ziaul Haq in Pakistan and forges a relationship and agreement to collaborate to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And to do so, they have to recruit uh, hardline, Sun mainly Sunni extremists from a global uh, stage because that will help uh, recruit uh, Islamist, Islamist extremists, uh, which were called Mujahideen, which means those who carry out jihad. So essentially we're saying jihadists at the time to band together and fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. At the time, the West and the United States viewed the Mujahideen in a very positive light because they were fighting against the communist Soviets in Afghanistan and it was in the context of the Reagan doctrine of containment. The most important um, aspect of all of this is that both Pakistan and Saudi Arabia assisted in this collaboration and process of recruiting uh, global Sunni extremists, training and equipping and financing in the Af Afghan-Pakistan border region, the new recruits, and sending them into Afghanistan to fight. Also, they did that uh, training and recruiting and indoctrination in Islamist extremist and militant ideology, which is a um, brand of uh, Saudi ideology called Wahhabism and Salafism, which is ultra-Orthodox, literalist, and can be very, very violent. That is that brand of ideology in Sunni Islam is the exception rather than the rule. Sunni Islam globally in general is not extremist or ultra orthodox. It's considered quote unquote moderate. Saudi Arabia embraces Wahhabism, which is a very different school of thought from 
mainstream Sunni Islam. It's within Sunni Islam, but it's very ultra-Orthodox and very um, literalist in its interpretation. That makes Saudi Arabia and um, Iran the antithesis to each other, because Iran, after the revolution, becomes a Shiite theocracy, and, and it's very ultra-Orthodox in Shiite ideology. What does Khomeini do in the political system and within the country of Iran once he comes to power? First of all, he anoints himself with the title supreme leader. Then he creates a brand new political system based on the Shiite theocracy. The written constitution is still there, which uh, originates from the turn of the 20th century when uh, the Shah of Iran, uh, the father of the um, second Shah, uh, comes to power after the Qajar dynasty. So the written constitution is still there. So throughout the monarchy, it was a constitutional monarchy. However, that monarch was very absolute in his power and his oppression. Khomeini does things that are not that different. Even though there's a written constitution still there, he revamps the entire political system on the basis of his vision of a Shiite theocracy. So he's the supreme leader. He creates a political system called the velayat faqi and that means the governing by Islamic jurists. Again, this is in the Shiite theocracy. And within that Shiite theocracy and the velayat e faqi uh, there is a hierarchy of clerics who are the ultimate uh, decision makers in political uh, matters. And of course, on top of that hierarchy is the supreme leader, which of course is Ayatollah Khomeini. The theocracy imposes strict dress codes for women, uh, including the top head-to-toe veil, top-down veil uh, called the chador. And then he also uh, creates a religious police to implement and enforce, sometimes violently, those new theocratic social policies. Again, he makes a lot of speeches and rhetoric about exporting the Shiite revolution in the region, and that makes Saudi Arabia and its allies, and even the United States allies in the region, very nervous. He also uh, promotes the idea in Iran that the United States and Israel are enemies of Iran. And then you have a pivotal event where the arch enemy of Ayatollah Khomeini next door, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, actually attacks Iran militarily in September of 1980 and, uh, and uh, triggers the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. Also ongoing in the region is the Lebanese Civil War from 1975 to 1990. And a product of that war is the creation initially of a militia called Hezbollah, which has Iran's uh, financial and other kinds of backing and support and training and indoctrination. And part and parcel in that is the support for Hezbollah and Iran and the relationship with Iran of Syria's Assad regime. During that time, the Assad regime consisted of President Assad, who was Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. So what, is, what are the sources of Iranian regime's hatred for the United States in particular? There are several sources or, or reasons. First is the initiating the 1953 coup d'etat, which derailed democracy in Iran and uh, ousted Mossadegh from power. He was democratically elected, 
Remember that this coup was uh, carried out by the CIA and British SIS. And they also uh, not just removed Mossadegh from power, but they reinstated the Shah of Iran as absolute monarch. The Shah of Iran was brutal, was oppressive towards his own people. The other reason in the public's eye in Iran for uh, contempt for the United States is the fact that the CIA and Israeli Mossad trained the Shah of Iran's secret police, the Savak, which again was very brutal, very violent towards the people. The United States had unwavering support for the Shah of Iran, who was a, a very oppressive ruler towards his people in Iran. And the other side of that same coin is that the people, the public in Iran, never saw the benefits of the oil wealth in Iran's economy. You had poverty in Iran, you had um, disenfranchised people in Iran, uh, and this is despite Iran being an oil-rich country, and it's only the royal family of the Shah of Iran and his clientele that benefited from the oil wealth. Now, people link that to Western support of the Shah, and therefore there's by association and by extension then there's anger towards the United States for that. Also, the Carter administration allowed the Shah of Iran to go to the United States for cancer treatment and that added to the contempt and animosity and anger towards the United States. Later on, the United States imposes various economic sanctions against Iran that adds to the animosity as well. Now, in the United States, there are reasons for anger and animosity and contempt towards Iran as well, post-revolution. Number one, of course, is, is the fact that revolutionaries engaged in raiding the US embassy in Tehran. That's a violation of US sovereignty. Taking the embassy staff hostage for 444 days, that's also a major violation of sovereignty and international law. Threatening US allies in the region, especially the Gulf Arab monarchies, uh, who happen to be majority Sunnis, uh, that's also a reason for the United States to be angry towards Ayatollah Khomeini and the Iranian regime, and also the fact that Khomeini had the agenda for wanting to export the Shia revolution throughout the region goes against US national interests in the region and especially threatens our uh, allies uh, and partners in the region, particularly the Sunni Arab partners and allies. We're angry also because of the creation of Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Marine barracks bombing uh, on October in October 1983, which killed 241 US Marines. That's been linked to not just Hezbollah, but of course Iran's support for Hezbollah. Prol proliferating proxy militias, th those would be Shia militias um, throughout the region, the Middle East region. Uh, Iran has engaged in that, especially in the last couple of decades. And that is a major threat in itself to U United States national interests in the region and US allies, uh, the, again, the Arab uh, Sunni uh, Gulf monarchies, but particularly uh, Israel as well. And then Iran has shown unwavering support for the Assad regime in Syria, beginning with the father, Hafez, Hafez al-Assad in Syria, but also uh, once he died and his son, Bashar al-Assad, succeeded him. So we see unwavering support uh, by Iran of the Assad regime in Syria. And the Assad regime maintains an anti 
U.S. and anti-Israel uh, position. So the United States, of course, is not happy about that. One note to all of this is an unfortunate note that the United States 2003 invasion of Iraq actually led to strategically the expansion of Iran's sphere of influence within Iraq. Looking at Iran's military assets, uh, Iran has regular forces, ground forces, Navy, Air Force, Air Defense Forces. Most important for the United States is the IRGC, or the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, that consists of ground forces, a, a navy, including marines, an aerospace force, um, a strategic missile force within that. Also, the Quds Force, which is Iran's special operations within the IRGC umbrella, a cyber electronic command, and the Basij, which is a paramilitary force. Iran's... Uh, Artesh, or, or regular forces, operate Iran's larger warships and uh, mainly operates in the Gulf of Oman and the Caspian Sea and the deep waters in the region and beyond. But it's the IRGC Navy that uh, covers the uh, maritime space and domain of the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. Of course, that's very strategically important for the flow of oil out of uh, the Persian Gulf region, and th therefore that's strategically important for the United States. The Basij is a volunteer paramilitary force under the IRGC with local organizations across the country. The regime taps into the Basij to carry out the crackdowns on uh, protests against the regime within Iran. So the Basij works domestically. They are brutal, they are um, very oppressive, they, um, they are unwavering in their uh, wielding, wielding of violence against unarmed civilians, uh, and they do the uh, work of the regime domestically. They act as an auxiliary law enforcement unit for the regime. You also have a mil Ministry of Intelligence and Security, which is, is responsible for law enforcement and man maintaining order. You have to bear in mind that for, for the regime, this is the Shiite theocracy, the supreme leader who is currently Ayatollah Khamenei, not Khomeini, he died, it's Khamenei. Everything about the security structure and military in Iran's Shiite theocracy is about maintaining and perpetuating the, uh, and protecting the Shiite theocracy and the political structure of this regime. You also have a law enforcement command, uh, which is uh, a uniformed police in Iran. What are the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, roles and goals? Again, as I mentioned, and it can't be emphasized enough, it's to protect and secure the revolution, the ideology of the revolution, and the structure, the, the Shiite theocracy and political structure of the revolution. They also serve to protect and secure the supreme leader of the Shiite theocracy. Again, today his name is... Ayatollah Khamenei. They are serving to protect and secure the Iranian regime's geopolitical interests and execute its strategies. It's also responsible for Iran's internal security and on the economic front, the IRGC is a partner in ownership of uh, interests and investments in various industries. So you see that they are stakeholders in Iran's economy as much as they are in its politics and political system. Iran also has a space agency. It was created in 2003. 
and an Iranian Space Research Center established in, two, in 2000. It has a Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces Logistics and an Aerospace Industries Organization, the AIO, which is under the Ministry of Defense. Iran's uh, IRGC Space Command was set up also in 2020. So to wrap up, you have some current status issues that are extremely important for understanding Iran's internal domestic priorities and also regional interests, strategies, and priorities, and also global dynamics. At this point, the United States, Israel, Sunni Arab allies in the region are all concerned about Iran going nuclear in terms of nuclear wep weapon status. Remember that the Obama administration had the JCPOA agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Agreement on uh, delaying Iran's enrichment of uranium. The Trump administration withdrew the United States from that agreement, but the JCPOA still exists and other uh, agreement stakeholders are still involved. The Iranian regime continues to support Hezbollah, numerous Shiite militias, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, both of whom are in Gaza. The United States and Israel have assassinated Iranian military leaders in the IRGC, including top generals, as well as nuclear scientists in order to slow the advancement of Iran's nuclear program. We, the United States, have also doubled down on many waves and stages of economic sanctions against the Iranian regime. Iranian proxy militias proliferate in the Middle East region, especially in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Bahrain, the Palestinian territories, uh, mainly through their support for Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And as you might know from the Red Sea crisis of shipping uh, the, in Yemen, the Houthis. And some of them, some of these Shiite militias and groups have targeted US troops in the region. We also witnessed a first ever Iranian military attack on Israel, which took place in April 2024. According to the BBC, quote, Iran's own direct attack on Israel was in turn retaliation for an Israeli strike on an Iranian consulate in Syria, in its capital, Damascus, which killed senior military commanders. Unquote. The Iranian regime grossly violates human rights. It carries out violent crackdowns against dissent domestically. Sometimes it even reaches out outside of Iran to take out opponents to the regime. It engages in torture and it executes political prisoners extrajudicially on a regular basis. The Iranian regime has close relations with Russia, China, and Syria's Assad regime. A few notes on the complex geopolitics involving Iran. So with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see today that the Iranian regime supplies Russia with drones against Ukraine. And you can assess that some of this is returning a favor because Russia helped Iran and the Assad regime in Syria uh, during the Syrian civil war. Iran also has a very strong ballistic missile program. Iran has the largest and most diverse ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. And this is despite economic sanctions. Most of the support and assistance 
and guidance from that comes from North Korea. Iran also has uh, technical and industrial capacity to develop long-range missiles, including ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles. Iran's indigenous Fateh 110 family of solid fuel missiles have achieved the precision necessary to destroy military and critical infrastructure targets. Iran's space program is pretty active. And now it has developed a more powerful rocket called the Seamorg and successfully placed three satellites into orbit in early 2024. A few things to note as we move forward. If and when Iran goes nuclear, it's pretty much guaranteed that Saudi Arabia will also go nuclear. The Sunni-Shia rivalry is exacerbated by the re-empowerment of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Also, there is a evidence of the resurgence in some areas in the Middle East, and particularly Afghanistan, of ISIS, or the Islamic State. Both the Taliban and the Islamic State are militant extremist Sunnis, and they create a problem, and you can even say an existential threat, to Shiites, and that means, by translation, Iran uh, as a whole, because Iran is a Shiite country. It is not in the national interests of the United States and Iran to go to war against each other. But, for sure, the asymmetric aggression will continue on both sides. I'm closing with a list of resources that you can use to learn more about the Iran-Saudi rivalry. Particularly, I highly recommend the Frontline PBS documentary, Bitter Rivals. There's a lot of um, resources about the Arab-Israeli or Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But Iran, of course, through Hezbollah and many other dynamics and perspectives, is involved more indirectly, but nonetheless, has a, the regime has an anti-Israel position. So it's important for you to understand that context regarding Iran and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And then there are several books, um, and also the CIA World Factbook uh, country profile on Iran. Uh, the last thing is that as of May of 2024, the president of Iran and the foreign minister of Iran died in a helicopter crash. We have elections that we're going to observe and witness in Iran coming up, and the main thing is that no one knows, as of right now, who will succeed the supreme leader, the current supreme leader, who is very old right now, uh, the supreme leader of Iran, succession is in question. No one knows as of right now who that might be. Whoever that might be, and assuming that the Iranian regime and revolutionary system and structure remain in place in the near and distant future, is still going to have a lot of bearing on US interests and concerns in the region. Thank you for listening. <laughs>